Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. Today we shall be talking about the fundamental principles of remote sensing. So far you already know and have studied the concept of space and time, global positioning system and its applications, various space agencies that exist in world and in India as well as the geospatial platforms such as Bhuvan and Google Earth. So, in this module today, we shall be talking about the principles of remote sensing and the processes that are involved in that. So, we will begin with the source of energy, the electromagnetic radiations and their spectrum, the interaction of electromagnetic radiations within earth's atmosphere as well as with the earth's surface features. We shall also be studying about the process of data acquisition and interpretation in remote sensing and we will also try to study the importance of reference data in analysis of the spatial locations. So, thus all in all in this module you shall be made aware of the principles of remote sensing as well as how these remote sensors are used for monitoring, mapping and inventorying the natural resources that are present on the surface of the earth. So, the aim of the module is to help us understand the basic principle of remote sensing and the processes involved. We will begin with the fundamentals of electromagnetic energy and then consider how the energy interacts with the atmosphere and earth's surface features. Next, we will summarize the process of acquiring and interpreting imagery in both digital and analog formats. We will also discuss the role that the reference data plays in data analysis procedure and describe how the spatial location of reference data observed in the field is determined. So, this module deals with the electromagnetic energy sensors that are currently being operated from airborne and spaceborne platforms to assist in inventorying, mapping and monitoring earth's resources. So, the data collection by any scientific process can be done by two ways. First is in situ that is we go to the ground and collect the information and the second is remotely that is the information is collected without any physical contact with the object. So, what is remote sensing? It is the science and art of obtaining information about an object, area or phenomena through the analysis of data acquired by a device that is not in contact with the object, area or phenomena under investigation. Measurement of some property of an object by a recording device that is not in physical contact with the object is remote sensing. Data is collected for analysis to obtain information about the object's area or phenomena being investigated using various sensors. The remotely collected data can be of many forms including variations in force distributions, acoustic wave distributions or electromagnetic energy distributions. For example, a gravity meter acquires data on variations in the distribution of the force of gravity. Sonar that is sound navigation and ranging like a bat's na navigation system obtains data on variations in acoustic wave distributions. Our eyes acquire data on variations in electromagnetic energy distributions. So, next coming to how is remote sensing carried out. The first aerial photograph was carried out from hot air balloon in 1858 over the city of Boston. In 1903, pigeon mounted camera was used to collect the remotely sensed data. The latest in this trend is the satellites that have been used since 1960s and 70s to collect information about various features on the surface of the earth. Now, coming to the brief history of remote sensing, as I already mentioned, first aerial photograph from hot air balloon was carried out in 1858 by Gaspard Felix Tunakan, also known as Nadar. In 1903, pigeon mounted cameras were used as is shown in the figure and photography from airplanes was carried out in 1909. However, the term remote sensing was initially introduced in 1960. Before 1960, the term was generally used for aerial photography. In 1960s and 70s saw the primary platform used to carry remotely sensed instruments shift from aerial planes to satellites that is from airborne to spaceborne. In 1972, the first satellite Landsat was launched on July 23, 1972. 
it was initially named as earth resources technology satellite and was the first satellite designed to study and monitor the earth surface features more specifically its land masses in 1970s landsat multispectral scanners as well as airborne scanners were used 1980s saw the development of landsat thematic thematic mappers spot as well as advanced very high resolution radio meter popularly known as avhrr in 1990s airborne digital cameras radar as well as indian remote sensing satellites were uh, in prominent use besides the receive release of classified data as well as the failed launches in 2000s new satellites were launched and there were significant improvements in airborne digital cam cameras as well as active remote sensing uh, was done using lidar that is uh, uh, that is laser beams used for detection and ranging of natural resources in 2010s higher spatial and spectral resolution was achieved through satellite data and extensive use of lidar has been carried out besides use of hyperspectral data and unmanned aerial systems has also been in rising trend since 2010 okay this figure deals with the overall principle and the mechanism of remote sensing as you can see in the figure first we need to have a source of energy for carrying out remote sensing studies this is followed by the propagation of these energy radiations through the atmosphere the processes involved therein and then its interactions with the earth surface features both these stages involve the uh, interaction of the radiations with atmosphere as well as with the earth surface features after interaction with the earth surface features the radiations are retransmitted through the atmosphere to reach the sensors that are a part of uh, our remote sensing it could be aerial photography it could be space borne so overall from source of energy to the uh, transmission to atmosphere reaching sensors comes in the data acquisition stages this is followed by data analysis where the data obtained by the sensors is uh, analyzed and interpreted either visually or digitally depending on the type of data so visual interpretation is done for pictorial data while digital image processing is carried out for digital data after due analysis the information products are released that can be passed on to users or can be integrated with geographical information systems so we'll be studying about these details in the coming slides as i mentioned the first point is we should have a energy source or illumination it is the first requirement for remote sensing to have an energy source which illuminates or provides electromagnetic energy to the target of interest the most common is the solar energy which has a wide range of spectrum and can be used for remote sensing studies the second one is propagation of energy through the atmosphere as the energy travels from the source to the target it will come in contact with and interact with the atmosphere it passes through this interaction may take place again uh, when the energy travels back from the target to the sensor the third step is interaction with earth surface features once the energy makes its way to the target through the atmosphere it interacts with the target depending on the properties of both the targets as well as the radi radiations the fourth step is retransmission of energy through the atmosphere which involves similar process as in the second step of propagation of energy the next step is when the uh, energy reaches the airborne or space borne sensors so after the energy has been scattered or emitted from the target we require a sensor that is remote to collect and record the electromagnetic radiations generation of sensor data in pictorial and or dig digital form that is the energy that is recorded by the sensor has to be transmitted often in electronic form to a receiving and processing station where the data are processed into an image this could be hard copy or a digital image the second part is data analysis which involves <laughs> examining the data using various viewing and interpretation devices to analyze pictorial data and a computer received from sensor to extract information about the target which was illuminated the second is compiling the information generally in the form of hard copy maps 
and tables or as computer files that can be merged with other layers of information in a geographical information system popularly known as GIS. The last step is the presenting the information to the users for decision making process. So, the final element of remote sensing process is achieved when we apply the information that we have been able to extract from the imagery about the target in order to better understand it, reveal some new information or assist in solving a particular problem. Now, we will be studying about these details in about these steps in detail. As I mentioned, the first and foremost requirement is a source of energy. So, the electromagnetic energy is generally used for remote sensing studies of the earth surface features. This electromagnetic energy travels in a harmonic sinusoidal fashion at the velocity of light that is trained to 10 to the power 8 meters per second. As can be seen in the figure, distance from one wave peak to the next wave peak or from one um, throw to the next is known as wavelength and the number of peaks passing through a fixed point in a six in space per unit time is called as the wave frequency. In general, these electromagnetic radiations obey the wave equation of c is equal to mu lambda. In remote sensing, it is mostly common to categorize the electromagnetic energy waves by their wavelength location in the electromagnetic spectrum. The second step is energy interactions in the atmosphere. So, all radiations that are detected by remote sensors, they pass through some distance or length of the atmosphere that we call as path length irrespective of its source. The net effect of the atmosphere varies with this differences in the path, path length and also varies with the magnitude of energy signal being sensed, the atmospheric conditions present and the wavelengths involved. So, the atmosphere can have a profound effect on the intensity and spectral composition of radiation available to any sensing system. These electromagnetic radiations while passing through the atmosphere are attenuated. This attenuation is caused principally through the mechanism of atmospheric scattering and absorption. So, the first is scattering which is also called as the unpredictable diffusion or redirection of electromagnetic energy by the particles suspended in the atmosphere or large molecules of atmospheric gases. So, accordingly there are three types of scattering, Rayleigh scattering, Mai and non-selective scattering. So, coming to the first type of scattering that is Rayleigh scattering. Rayleigh scattering occurs when atmospheric particles diameter is much much smaller than the wavelength of the radiation. It is commonly observed high in the atmosphere and the scattering intensity is proportional to the is inversely proportional to the fourth power of wavelength. Thus, radiations with shorter wavelength is easier to be scattered by this mechanism. Rayleigh scattering generally occurs due to oxygen and nitrogen atoms in the atmosphere. An example is when there is no Rayleigh scattering, the sky appears black while in the presence of Rayleigh scattering, the general color of the sky is blue. During morning and evening when the path length travel is much larger, the sky appears orange or red. This Rayleigh scattering is responsible for the presence of haze in any satellite imagery. The next one is my scattering. In this type of scattering, the diameter of the particles is more or less equivalent to the wavelength of the radiation. So, the particles that have a mean diameter of 0.1 to 10 times the incident wavelength cause the my scattering. Examples include water vapor, smoke particles as well as fine dust. My scattering generally occurs in the lower atmosphere and is wavelength dependent that is it influences longer wavelengths. So, the scattering intensity is inversely proportional to the fourth power of wavelength and it ranges up to the scale where it depends, uh, it becomes independent of wavelength. Clear atmosphere has both Rayleigh scattering and my scattering, while my scattering is significant in slightly overcast skies. The non-selective scattering occurs when the particle size is much much larger than the wavelength. So, as a result of it, all the wavelengths that strike a particle are scattered equally. The examples include water droplets, ice crystals, volcanic ash and smog. This type of scattering is independent of wavelength. 
invisible wavelength equal quantities of blue green and red light is scattered hence fog and cloud appear white in color so this figure shows you a comparative analysis of the three types of scattering as you can see in Rayleigh scattering the size of the particle or a gas molecule is much much smaller than the wavelength in my scattering the size of the particle as well as the radiation wavelength is equivalent while in non selective scattering as example is of water vapor the size of the particle is much much larger compared to the wavelength <coughs> effects of scattering primarily include the reason for haze in any remote sensing Im image as a result it decreases the spatial detail on the images it also decreases the contrast between the features in any remote sensing image the second factor which causes attenuation is absorption so the atmosphere it prevents or strongly attenuates transmission of radiation through the atmosphere this results in effective loss of energy to atmospheric constituents primarily water vapor carbon dioxide and ozone molecules are the most efficient absorbers of solar radiations the ozone molecule absorbs ultraviolet radiations high in the atmosphere while carbon dioxide absorbs middle and far infrared radiations in the range of 13 to 17.5 microns in the lower atmosphere water vapor molecules absorb middle to far infrared radiations in the lower atmosphere ranging from 5.5 to 7 microns and also greater than 27 microns coming to the concept of atmospheric windows there are certain wavelengths that can relatively easily pass through the atmosphere without any significant attenuation such range of wavelengths are called as atmospheric windows in this figure you can see the spectral characteristics of the energy source primarily the sun and the earth their spectral curves the atmospheric transmittance and as a result the common remote sensing system so you can see for the visible range human eye acts as a remote sen sensor and it includes photography as well as multispectral scanners thermal scanners operate in the range of far infrared uh, portion of spectrum while the radar waves and pass microwaves they operate in 1 millimeter to 1 meter range of the wavelength in the spectrum so the wavelength ranges in which the atmosphere is particularly transmissive of energy are referred to as atmospheric windows the interrelationship between the energy sources and ap atmospheric absorption characteristics has been shown previously it also shows the this figure also shows the spectral distribution of the energy emitted from the sun and the earth features these two curves represent the most common source of energy used in remote sensing in this figure the shaded regions represent the spectral regions where the atmosphere blocks the radiation energies so our remote sensing data acquisition is primarily limited to non blocked spectral regions that are also called as the atmospheric windows so as mentioned previously these following wavelength ranges act as atmospheric windows for example 0.3 to 0.7 microns in uv and visible portion of the spectrum 0.77 to 0.91 microns in the near infrared portion of the spectrum middle infrared portion of the spectrum has two ranges 1.55 to 1.75 microns and 2.05 to 2.4 microns far infrared portion of the spectrum has three ranges 3.5 to 4.1 microns 8 to 9.2 microns and 10.2 to 12.4 microns microwave atmospheric windows comprise of the spectrum range from 1 millimeter to 1 meter these atmospheric windows are important for sensor design of any remote sensing system the sensor selection primarily depends on the spectral sensitivity of the sensors available presence or absence of atmospheric windows in the spectral range source magnitude and spectral composition of the energy available in these ranges ultimately the choice of spectral range of the sensor must be based on the manner in which the inter energy interacts with the features under investigation so next is energy interaction with the earth surface features as we all know electromagnetic energy incident on any given earth surface feature interacts in three fundamental ways either it gets reflected or it gets absorbed or it gets transmitted interrelationship among these three energy interactions 
may be given as uh, the incident energy at any given wavelength is the sum of reflected energy, absorbed energy and transmitted energy at the same wavelength. Interrelationships among this mechanism of reflection, absorption and transmission also depends on two points. First is the proportion of energy reflected, absorbed and transmitted will vary for different earth features depending on their material type and condi conditions. Secondly, even within a given feature type, the portion of reflected, absorbed and transmitted en energy will vary at different wavelengths. Within the visible portion of the spectrum, these spectral variations will result in visual effects that is called as color. As many remote sensing systems operate in the wavelength regions in which reflected energy predominates, the reflectance properties of the earth features are very important. The reflectance characteristics of the earth surface features may be quantified by measuring the portion of incident energy that is reflected. This is measured as a function of wavelength and is called as spectral reflectance which is mathematically defined as the ratio of reflected energy to the ratio of incident energy at the same wavelength. Any graph that shows the spectral reflectance of an object as a function of wavelength is termed as spectral reflectance curve. The next stage of remote sensing involves data acquisition followed by interpretation. The detection of electromagnetic energy can be performed either photographically or in electronically. The process of photography uses chemical reactions on the surface of a light sensitive film to detect energy variations within a scene. They are relatively simple and inexpensive to pro and provide a high degree of spatial detail and geometric integrity. Electronic sources generate an electric electrical signal that corresponds to the energy variations in the original scene. An example of this electronic sensor is a video camera. Electronic so sensors offer the advantage of a broader spectral range of sensitivity, improved calibration potential and the ability to electronically store and transmit data. Electronic sensors signals are generally recorded onto some magnetic medium subsequently the signals can be converted to an image or a photographic film using a film recorder. In remote sensing, the term photograph is reserved exclusively for images that were detected as well as recorded on the film. The more generic term image is used for any pictorial representation of image data. As the term image relates to any pictorial product, all photographs are images. Not all images however are photographs. A common exception to the above terminology is the use of the term digital photography. So, the digital photography is now the common way to refer to the process of digital data collection. So, here is an example of a digital image data. As you can see the first figure shows the original digital image and the second figure shows the enlargement of the image in the form of grids of rows and columns. The basic element which can be a, which is a small square in this picture is referred to as picture element or a pixel. The next figure shows the pixel quantization or based on the digital data which in general explains the brightness values or digital numbers of these pixels. <coughs> so, every remote sensing system has a limit on how small an object on the earth's surface can be and still be seen by a sensor as being separate from its surroundings. This limit is called as the spatial resolution of that sensor and it indicates how well a sensor can record spatial detail. The ground area that is represented by a six single pixel in a digital image may correspond closely to larger or smaller than the sensor spatial resolution. In some cases, perhaps as a result of analog to digital conversion process or of a digital image manipulation such as resampling. We shall be studying about these in the coming chapters. Thus, depending on the spatial resolution of the sensor and the spatial structure of the ground area being sensed, digital images comprise a range of pure and mixed pixels. In general, the larger the percentage of mixed pixels, the more limited is the ability to record and extract spatial detail in an image. 
Now, reference data. The acquisition of re reference data often referred by the term ground truth involves collecting measurements or observations about the objects area or phenomena that are being remotely sensed. Reference data may involve field measurements of temperature and other physical or chemical properties of various features. The geographic positions at which such field measurements are made are often noted on a map base to facilitate their location in a corresponding remote sensing image using GPS receiver. Reference data might be used to serve any or all of the following purposes. First is to aid in the analysis and interpretation of remotely sensed data, to calibrate a sensor, to verify information extracted from remote sensing data. Ground based measurements of the reflectance or emittance of surface materials to determine their spectral response patterns is one form of reference data collection. For example, in the acquisition of field measurements, spectroradiometer may be operated in a number of modes ranging from handheld to helicopter or aircraft mounted. The figure below shows a highly portable spectroradiometer that is well suited for handheld operations. Through a fiber optic input, this particular system acquires a continuous spectrum by recording data in over 1000 narrow bands simultaneously. Second example is a versatile all-terrain instrument designed primarily for collecting spectral measurements in agricultural cropland environments as shown below. The system provides high clearance necessary for making measurements over mature row crops and the tracked wheels that allow access to difficult landscape positions. So, coming to the uh, important aspect that is the applications of remote sensing. Why do we need to carry out remote sensing? It has a wide range of applications which range from uh, multiple view approach to data collection. So, accordingly there are various stages, first is multi stage sensing where data about a site is collected from multiple altitudes. The second is multi spectral sensing where data are acquired simultaneously in several spectral bands. The multispectral approach forms the heart of numerous remote sensing applications involving discrimination of earth resource types and conditions. The third is multitemporal sensing, where data about a site is collected on more than one occasion. This approach is frequently taken to monitor land use change, such as suburban development in urban fringe areas. In the multi-stage approach, satellite data may be analyzed in conjunction with high altitude data, low altitude data and ground observations. Examples for multi-stage sensing techniques include detection, identification and analysis of forest disease and insect problems. This example shows the multi-stage remote sensing concept where we can have a ground observation system, we can also have a low altitude data. For, uh, uh, or we can have a high, high altitude data provided by aerial photography and the highest altitude data is satellite data which can capture the images of a uh, surface features. Coming to the importance of remote sensing, as we all know large amount of data is needed for studying the earth uh, surface features and remote sensing helps us in collecting that data. It reduces the manual field work dramatically. It also allows for retrieval of data for regions that are difficult or impossible to reach. For example, open ocean, hazardous terrain such as high mountains or extreme weather areas. Ocean depths as well as atmosphere uh, is also difficult to access. Remote sensing data allows for the collection of much more data in a shorter amount of time. Our digital imagery acquired either through aerial photography or space borne sensors, it greatly enhances the geographic information system in two ways, either directly or indirectly. Directly the imagery can serve as a visual aid, while indirectly the image can serve as a source to derive information such as land use land cover of a place the atmospheric emissions, vegetation, water bodies and cloud cover. It can also be used to carry out change detection studies including sea ice, coastlines or changes in sea level. So, dear students, 
to summarize the entire module. I hope by the end of this module, you will be able to appreciate the basic principle of remote sensing, what is remote sensing, how is it carried out as well as the various processes that are involved in remote sensing. We have studied that the entire process of remote sensing can be summarized into two categories, data acquisition and data analysis. Data acquisition involves a source of energy, the interaction of the radiations within the atmosphere, its interaction with the earth's surface features, retransmission through the atmosphere as so as to reach the sensors. The products thus obtained, uh, they need to be analyzed which comes in the second stage of data analysis. So, the interpretation can be done for the data, if it is a pictorial data, we need to do visual interpretation. As well as for digital data, we carry out image processing before any analysis. The products, information products obtained after analysis are further integrated into geographic information system or they can be passed on to the users. So, students, I hope you would also be able to appreciate the importance of remote sensing as well as the application of remote sensing in various uh, studies of natural resources. I hope you all will be benefited from this module. Thank you.